Morning already. Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys can hear me. Morning, sir. All right, morning. Um, okay, for those who just came in, uh, TC students, please scan your QR code to the left, and pre TC scan your uh, the QR code on the right. Okay, before we start our session. Right now, uh, I think we're still waiting for Dr. Mahmud. Oh, Dr. Mahmud is here already. Yeah, I'm already here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mahmud. Yeah. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Assalamualaikum salam and good morning, everybody. Okay, students, please. Uh, this is your final call to scan the QR code before I give this session fully to uh, Dr. Mahmud. Yeah. Okay, two more minutes, two more minutes to scan the QR code, final call. TC students to the left and pre TC students to the right. Please scan the QR code. Okay, one more minute before I start share, uh, stop sharing. Can okay, QR code fast, fast, yeah, quickly.
Okay, I think I should stop sharing. And uh, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, I think I give this session to you. Okay, thank you, right. Dr. Izzy. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, very good morning, uh, all of you. Uh, okay, uh, I am given, uh, I think, uh, for two hours. Uh, we may reach the two hours or may not be uh, for two hours. Uh, depends on how lively the discussion will be. <coughs> My name is Mahmoud. I don't know how many of you already met me. Uh, uh, anyone of you new to, um, uh, uh, are you, any one of you are new students? Can you please uh, show indication I just want to know how many of you are new students. If you can just uh, raise up your hand, uh, show your uh, your video, just uh, show me your hand if you are new student, so that I can see um, and I can see how can I um, manage the uh, the presentation. May I know how many of you are uh, new students? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Muhammad Sharudin is showing uh, uh, hands up there. Okay, quite a number. Uh, who else? Uh, the reason being uh, some, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, many of the terms are new, so that I uh, will have to use. Uh, uh, layman terms, or I will have to dwell a little bit on the terms to explain so that uh, the terms uh, so that you know what they are. Okay, I can see quite a number of of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, before that, um, uh, you are taking um, MBES one o one nine, isn't it? Doctor, is it? Uh, yes, Dr. Mahmoud. Yeah, okay. Social Mahmoud. culture. Social culture. And then uh, are you doing housing for this semester? Yeah, they are doing housing for the okay. semester. All right, okay. All right. Uh, I was asked by Dr. Uh, Isaac to give a lecture on linking uh, research to design. Uh, uh, when I check the slides um, uh, for um, for new students, that uh, because that, uh, that that the lecture is um, is meant for not only um, uh, cult uh, social culture uh, subject students, but also for everybody. So I think it's quite general. Uh, it's quite boring in a way. So I. I selected another um, uh, lecture, which is actually uh, directly connecting research to design, but focusing on uh, behavioral research. So I think that will be more uh, comprehensive, uh, will be more relevant, especially to the work that you are uh, having at the moment. So I think um, I can just share uh, that lecture. If we have time, maybe we can uh, expand the discussion a little bit. Let me share with you uh, the presentation. Just like, I think this is the one. Can you see it? Yes, Rata, clearly. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, this lecture, I think, uh, was delivered a number of years ago to, uh, uh, I think, a master student, uh, Persisir, and also Perdana, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, more or less the same lecture uh, in the different uh slightly different uh, audience uh, was uh, presented 
to uh, th there was a lecture in uh, Indonesia. I presented uh, this one, but uh, a different version. Okay. And I think the same lecture I delivered to uh, a number of, to sorry, to other school of architecture, uh, not UTM, to share with them uh, the title is Designing for People. Uh, designing for people means uh, designing for uh, the users rather than the designers. So this is important. Uh, Although I discovered uh, there is a, a, a thesis, uh, a thesis suggesting uh, this is uh, uh, a research which is basically uh, within um, psychology, uh, not environmental psychology. Uh, the area we are dealing with in this lecture very much focusing on environmental psychology uh, another area of psychology, which is, um, I can't remember the term that is used to explain, to describe the, uh, the area of the, the, the discipline of the psychology, um, which is dealing with, um, I forgot, this is about mental, uh, mental processes, uh, very much uh, suggesting, okay, this is what is suggested by that. Uh, school of thought, uh, suggesting that what designers think uh, from what he designed will be uh, repeated by the users, meaning that the space that architects design, the space the architect proposed, uh, the feeling that the architects uh, wanted to uh, materialize based on this design, will come the same uh, with the experience of uh, the users uh, when they dwell into the space. Meaning that what architects uh, value, how architects value the spaces will be similar. There is a term, I forgot the term, which will be similar experience uh, experienced by uh, the users. Um, I think that that is an interesting uh, suggestion by a different school of thought. But in environmental psychology, um, we have been uh, propo uh, propagating. Uh, I think if you, uh, any one of you, have read any of articles, any work by Arapopo and also uh, by by me and my students, uh, we are propagating that. Um, what architects feel about a design uh, will not be the same as how the users experience them. Meaning that if you think the bedroom is like this, you value as a designer a bedroom is like this, uh, it is not going to be the same uh, as how the uh, expected users would uh, experience, would value uh, the space. So they would see it differently. We see it differently, architects see it differently, users see it differently. That is actually the basic um, theories that we uh, use, theories uh, that we use based on environmental psychology. Um, for your information, uh, environmental psychology is, uh, is one of the many branches of psychology. Uh, there are 10 to 12 uh, disciplines within psychology, including um, uh, clinical psychology. Um, you know, any one of you have problem uh, with your, uh, your, your, your mental uh, disturbances, then you have to see um, the uh, psychiatrist and psychiatrist actually doing works within this uh, clinical psychology. And there are cognitive psychology. Uh, uh, please remember the word, the word cognitive, cognitive psychology, uh, behavioral psychology, uh, industrial psychology. There are a number of psychology. One of the uh, area of psychology, uh, that is uh, where architects or um, uh, community in architecture normally referred to is environmental psychology. 
Okay, so environmental psychology is about the relationship between uh, the person and the environment, between you and your house, you and your office, between uh, an elderly with his uh, elderly home, for example, children with their, with their uh, playgrounds. So um, the difference between environmental psychology and other disciplines in psychology is that uh, in environmental psychology, uh, the researchers tend to uh, give uh, focus priority um, for the environmental uh, subject, for the environmental attributes. So uh, the dimension of the environment is given priority in the research. So meaning that uh, we uh, link uh, human um, factors, uh, the mental factors, uh, the person, the personal factors, we link them with the environmental factors, with the, um, the environment, the built environment especially, okay? Uh, there are two different environment. One is uh, big, uh, sorry, built environment. The other one is natural environment. There are three or four uh, different environmental uh, definition. Um, um, uh, we are going to see it if we have the time to see them. But uh, for, your, uh, for you to remember, there are uh, two basic environmental setting. One is natural environment. That is uh, environment that is not uh, touched. Okay, so including the, the jungle, the forest, uh, the air, you know. And the other one is built environment and the one that we created as architects. Okay, so I hope you understand the context of this lecture. Uh, when, I, uh, when you look at the, the title, Designing for People, uh, the, the stress of the lecture is that uh, there are a lot of differences between how architects view the, uh, the the architecture and how the people, the receivers, the 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 the, uh, the users view the architecture. So we 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 have that conception in our mind uh, when you uh, listen to this lecture. Okay, um, then I think we can proceed. Um, can I ask you, uh, is it noisy? Because I have a fan that I need to switch on the fan and uh, I receive complaint uh, um, uh, from uh, many session, people are complaining about my fan, the sound is terrible. Um, are you okay with the sound? Can you, is the sound of my fan is this disturbing you? Sounds good. Okay, thank you. If you feel, if you, if you had uh, a lot of disturbances due to my fan, I think I can just stop the fan. Just let me know, don't worry. Feel free to, to say it. Okay, um, this is, uh, I use the term user-centered design process. Um, when I say user-centered design process, uh, actually the term user-centered has been used in different fields. Uh, I am referring to um, the focus of the design is on the users. So I call it user-centered, okay? So uh, user-centered housing design uh, sounds funny, is it? But uh, it is real because uh, many a time uh, users are buying uh, the houses that um, they didn't involve in the design of the houses. So it is very much architect or de developer-centered um, design rather than user-centered. So we have to change uh, the, um, the, uh, the process instead of uh, designer-centered. It should be user-centered. So um, this is about uh, focusing on the users. So when we talk about user-centered uh, design process, these are the processes. Um, uh, the, the blue line, this is, a di the, this is a, I would say, this is a concept, okay? If you see uh, the boxes there, there are subjects for design. There are uh, uh, aspect of end users. There are aspects of researcher. And uh, the other one is you, which is a designer. Okay, the traditional uh, design process, uh, especially uh, for housing. I think housing is one of the 
uh, very common user centered uh, design process. Okay, um, the blue line is uh, is the traditional uh, method of delivering uh, the design. Okay, uh, if you look at the uh, the blue line, it begins with uh, expectation of the users, the end users. Okay, needs, expectation, perception, uh, preferences, and then this uh, data on needs, expectation, perception, and preferences, uh, preferences are given to the designers. If you can see, it is only a two uh, stages process. Uh, the end users uh, state down what they need, what they prefer, and given to the designer. And designers um, interpret the criteria and uh, and uh, and develop uh, the design. And then the the green line, you see the 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 dash line, the the the, the green line, the dash line. Is the process of the design that uh, once the designer develop the design, and then the design is uh, brought into reality, becomes a building, and the building, uh, the buildings are given to the end user. So that is the traditional, uh, the conventional. Even now, is still happening. Uh, users have their own um, uh, dreams and fancies, uh, needs, expectation given to the designers to interpret and bring them into the design and the design is uh, brought into uh, reality put on the ground in the form of buildings and uh, give them back to uh, the end user but that is an ideal process where the end users are involved if you have a piece of land you are um, the, the the owner of the uh, of the of that piece of land you want to build a house you mention to the architects what you want uh, that is considered as uh, an ideal process. The worst process is when uh, the end users are represented by developers. They are not represented by uh, themselves. They are represented by developers, which seldom uh, uh, developers uh, go and see the users and ask them, what do you want? That, that seldom happens. Unless if you have what we call a user participated design uh, process, which is very uncommon in the in the common housing delivery, most of the time is very much um, developer and designers or architects relationship. That is even worse. So uh, the needs, expectation, perception, and preferences are not actually uh, representing uh, represented by um, the developer and given to the designer. So therefore, uh, you got a design which are not uh, uh, up to your standard. Okay, so that is um, why I think there are, uh, we can talk, um, uh, you know, further on this. Um, we will never end uh, the discussion of the grievances faced by the end users because they didn't uh, know what um, they are buying for because the uh, the houses that they bought are by somebody else. Okay. But another process is uh, developing design criteria through scientific approaches. Um, uh, this is actually a quite a new move uh, in uh, in the design globally, uh, not only in Malaysia, but in many places in the world. Uh, but I think the rate of uh, success and the, the rate of implementation is still very little uh, um, globally. Okay, the, uh, the second process um, is that uh, the needs and expectation of the users are channeled to a research uh, process, okay, uh, in which um, the two, if you notice subject for design, the space, environment, products or services, they are together. Okay, uh, the environmental factors, um, subject for design, we can uh, put another word as environmental factors. And um, user uh, personal factors, needs expectation, are put together and processed using 
uh, 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 research uh, processes. Uh, I think um, um, you might have come across already. Um, uh, some of the methodologies we will see later, um, which will, that are being used by the researchers to process all these, these data. And this data will be fed to the designers and designers will be designing based on this. Uh, this is another level of data processing uh, in order for uh, the designers to understand what are needed by uh, the, the, the by uh, the users and what are uh, expected uh, from uh, the environment that that are to be created by the designers. So that is actually uh, the two different process: uh, the traditional or conventional process, uh, the one in blue line, and uh, the other process is uh, the other one, which is the red line. Um, so this is actually um, uh, for your information in my other lectures, uh, I would explain to you why we changed from uh, previous uh, education system in architecture. I think in 19, in 2009, we started uh, to look at it. Uh, still remember, um, I was the one who headed the team in developing the uh, the new curriculum, the new curriculum of architecture, um, the one that you are having now, uh, it was um, undergraduate uh, studies uh, until part two. Um, uh, it was an undergraduate studies, meaning that when you graduated, you are still an undergraduate. Okay, uh, so we changed that program. The part two is supposed to be master's level. What is the difference? What are the differences between master's and uh, bachelor uh, of architecture? The difference is very basic. That is in master's, you have element of research. The intention of the, uh, of the nation, uh, of the professional body uh, was to uh, to produce architects with critical and analytical thinking. Architects who are not using only intuition. You know intuition? Intuition is just your feeling, your, 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 your uh, educated assumption as an architect uh, to produce uh, the design. So we want to change that into a more uh, critical and analytical uh, views on architecture. Uh, whatever field of architecture, whatever uh, sectors of architecture, may it be uh, office building and housing, or hospital design and whatnot. So uh, we want uh, the nation, the architects to be uh, research-based architects rather than uh, as, um, you know, intuitive-based uh, architects. So that is why in our program, uh, we encourage Actually, the master's level in UTM, uh, we uh, we uh, we determine that we uh, do it uh, research based. So the design are research based design. So of course, um, uh, we are still exploring area of research uh, suitable for uh, our niche area at UTM. Okay. So this is one of the examples. So um, sorry, I dwell quite uh, in lengthy here so that you understand. Uh, especially the new student. Uh, the way uh, we do design uh, at UTM um, for must at master's level is research based. So this, these are, um, if you look at the two differences, I hope you understand why we call it uh, research based design. So uh, previously, uh, from users direct to designer and designer. Uh, do their duties um, based on whatever they receive from the client or the user or the develop developer for that matter. But now uh, we use um, what we what we call uh, empirical data based on research, so that we have more uh, reliable data to be used for the design. Okay. Okay, I think um, this is uh, the ultimate goal of creating environment. Um, the ultimate goal of creating environmental setting is to achieve person environment congruence. Uh, this is from uh, my, my own writing. Um, if you see 
my name is Mahmud bin Muhammad Jusan. But uh, in uh, the internet, if you type in Jusan, so you will see uh, my my articles. But I came to know previously. I thought my name is the only uh, name in this country, Jusan. You know. But later I came to know when we have this internet, I came to know there are many other people named Jusan also. So I <laughs> I look at my name in different way now. Okay, and that, that is not within this lecture. Okay, the ultimate goal of creating environmental setting, uh, environmental setting, uh, when we talk about environmental setting, uh, it can be living environment, it can be office environment and whatnot. So that is environmental setting is to achieve uh, person environment congruence. We want to achieve uh, a congruence, yeah, a keserasian, the entire uh, the person and the environment, a congruence between the person and environment. This is actually what we are propagating. You know, it, um, at least my research team and I think uh, all um, researchers are propagating this. We have to design um, an environment uh, to suit, uh, to be congruent with the person who will be using uh, the environment. Okay. Um, to effectively relate the environment with the users. Remember, uh, my first line is um, trying to uh, make it more relevant, uh, the environment to the users. Uh, to uh, effectively relate the environment with the users, hence to achieve uh, person environment congruence, PEC is person environment congruence, it is necessary to understand behavior and the environment. Uh, it is understand for you to understand um, uh, the behavior of the, um, of the users, the expected users with the environment. Um, using scientific method. So we are propagating a scientific method in order to understand users. So uh, for your information, I mentioned earlier uh, earlier in this lecture, uh, one um, discipline in psychology is behavior or behaviorism. So here behaviorism is a psychological approach um, based on emp uh, empirical observation you know what is empirical and when when we talk when we say empirical empirical is uh, the data or the information or the results gained through experience or through research method so that is what empirical is all about so when we talk about empirical observation meaning that scientific observation of human uh, behavior you know previously they people used uh, representing uh, rep sorry uh, people represented animal behavior to human uh, that was uh, 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 earlier in the development of uh, psychology okay stimuli in the environment and the, uh, the behavioral responses which follows an attempt to turn uh, to apply stimuli to provoke desired responses this uh, the language are quite technical don't worry what you need uh, to understand is uh, you need to use uh, uh, scientific method uh, within uh, this um, um, behavior behaviorism psychology um, in order to understand uh, human behavior, uh, human response to the environment. All right, um, having that in mind, uh, remember the first two or three slides which I have uh, explained to you, uh, the need uh, to be scientific, um, then I think uh, we can properly uh, define the role of uh, designers, uh, your role as uh, designers. Okay, designers should be a cognitive expert. Uh, when we say cognitive expert, a cognitive or cognition is a, is a technical word of psychology. When we take, when you say, excuse me, when we say cognitive expert, uh, it means that Cognitive means uh, thinking, uh, expert who are thinking, or expert who are learner, who have the knowledge. Okay, uh, cognitive psychology is normally applied in education. 
uh, because it, uh, you know, it, it, it is dealing with the way people think and the way people um, use their um, their ability to remember and to think, to process. So that is concrete. So architects are uh, are expected to be cognitive expert, you know, who are thinking and have knowledge, as well as humanistic facilitator. You are facilitating human being. You are not facilitating yourself. Of course, you are also a human being, but more importantly, you are facilitating human being who will be using the space, the spaces that you are designing, and who are able to integrate. So you are an integrator. Scientific data on human needs. So this is um, the uh, the. Um, the research aspect that we mentioned earlier, and aesthetical uh, attributes. Being uh, an architect, uh, you love um, aesthetical attributes to be in your design. In order to form buildings that are that meet practical expectation of the client, so the building will meet practical expectation of the client. Of course, you uh, what you dream uh, can also be achieved. And when you are also allowed to put your aesthetical attributes on the building. If you read it again, uh, you will understand uh, what designers, uh, the role of designers are expected by us, by uh, the general public. You should be a cognitive expert, clever, um, thinking, thoughtful, cognitive expert, as well as humanistic facilitator. You are sensitive to uh, to human being and who are able to integrate. You are to integrate scientific data on human needs and aesthetical attributes in order to form buildings that, are, that meet practical expectation of the client. This is extremely important. If you under, can understand this role and if you can achieve this role, uh, you are uh actually uh fulfilling expectation of the people you know in general okay um i hope you can capture uh the first second and third um uh, slides okay um now we go um beyond that uh, into the process of uh, understanding uh, human behavior into architecture. The process of considering human behavior into an architectural project, this is quite straightforward, can be summarized as follows. These are the processes. One, systematic elicitation of behavioral data for uh, the design. Okay, um, this is the processes. Uh, if we take research as a paradigm of design, a process of design, then this is actually uh, a, a, a very important um, process, uh, early, earlier process, the, uh, the preliminary process before uh, you delve into uh, the actual uh, composition of the building. One, systematic elicitation of behavioral data for the design. Second, data formation for use in the design process, which takes place in terms of establishment of behavioral program and later building program. What are behavioral, what is meant by behavioral program? Behavioral program is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the personal program, okay? A program that is uh, expected uh, by uh, the person. Okay, who will be using the space? Um, you know, for example, what is the behavioral program? Uh, if you look at uh, a, a bedroom, for example, uh, the behavioral aspect of bedroom is how they sleep, how they want um, uh, the uh, the bedroom to be. So, if you if you if you heard what I mentioned, the word how they want the bedroom to be, that is actually referring to uh, expectation of the users uh, from the space given to them. That is the behavior we expect. So when we look at that 
uh, definition very closely. So you will see that um, when we talk about behavioral program, it is very much uh, personal. Uh, the bedroom is supposed to be a space for the person, should be suitable for the person. And the program is the one that you should look at, you know, if you are designed uh, a house, the behavioral program would be different from one room to the other. So you can see the bedroom is different. Um, the uh, Even the toilets are different, okay? And later, um, um, you should transform into building program, okay? Building program is very much project brief uh, formation. And uh, I, I, I hope you can understand now the difference between behavioral program and building program. Uh, I have mentioned behavioral program. Building program is uh, the building itself. The minimum uh, expectation uh, in the building program is the sizes, the name of the room, the purpose of the room, and the sizes of the spaces. So that is the basic information. Other information would be uh, the detailed one beyond uh, only the sizes, sometimes the color, yeah? uh, the finishes, yeah? the form of the of the ceiling, for example. Where do you want the light uh, to get through uh, the openings into your bedroom? You know, um, uh, how far you want uh, your space to be close to the tree? So these are very technical um, uh, definition of uh, the requirement. As I said, minimum is you know what are the purpose of the space and what are the sizes of the space. Those are what we call building program. You know, in, in architecture, uh, you you have SOA. What is SOA? SOA, schedule of uh, areas, is it? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so uh, it is beyond that. Building program is actually uh, the, uh, uh, representing not only uh, the spaces, but also the, the meaning of the spaces. Then uh, design solution. So putting all the data together using individual skills as designer. So this is what we call, uh, this is actually uh, completely your skills. So you, you as a designer, you are a cognitive expert and you are also a creative expert. So uh, we, or they depends on you on how to put all those information, okay, the, uh, the user data, the behavioral program, the building program, and you put them into um, a solution, okay, solution. We talk about solution data. Uh, that is expecting your skills as designers uh, to do all these creative works. All right, um, I think I have already explained to you uh, uh, the move from uh, the traditional or the conventional method of designing into uh, research-based design. Uh, and then uh, that would change uh, the role of the designers. And, um, and then we suggested also the processes for a designers uh, to go through. Uh, in order to uh, to create what we call analytical works or work that are based on research or research-based design. Okay, systematic elicitation of behavioral data. Okay, um, I use the term behavioral data. Uh, if you check behavior, behavior is the thing that you see, okay, in um, uh, behavioral, behavioral psychology actually uh, was based on, you know, how you see uh, the person doing his activities. So behavior is talking about nonverbal, not based on what they say. But in this context, we are also referring to uh, the verbal data, uh, behavioral data, which are also taking into consideration uh, the verbal data uh, by the respondents, by the especially uh, your um, uh, users to be. Okay, elicitation is um, another word of obtaining, so systematic obtaining of behavioral data. So the appropriate word is a systematic elicitation of behavioral data. Source of data. 
So this, um, there are two basic source, sources of data. If you are um, dealing with uh, behavioral data, there are two basic uh, sources of data. Uh, one is the personal uh, factors. Uh, this is the factors uh, which are inside uh, the personal system, inside the, inside the person, not inside the body, uh, inside the person, because the person is more than the body. I hope you understand that. You know, if um, if I ask you, do you know uh, where is your brain? Yes, I think you can answer. And do you know where is your mind? Then uh, you start wondering, uh, you know, uh, where is actually my mind? Is it in the brain? No, not necessarily, not necessarily in the brain. So actually the mind is actually within, within yourself. Where is it coming from? Aha, uh -huh, that is a question uh, that has been debated. So we are not going to debate on that. So that is part of the personal factors. Okay, people are exploring on these personal factors uh, in depth. Okay, so another source of data, uh, of data uh, is uh, environmental factors. So there are two uh, main source of data. Okay, um, when we talk about personal factors, there are influencing personal factors in the environment. Okay, personal fa factors, uh, factor uh, personal. We talk about myself. Uh, you have at least five factors. You have your needs. You have your norms. You have your personality, your personal being. That is personal personality. Your values your goals, actually there are uh, many others uh, which I don't include here. Um, I think if you can just remember these five, um, then uh, you can grasp what is meant by personal factors. Needs are, you know, uh, uh, something that uh, you uh, requires, okay, uh, needs. So needs something that is dealing with reality. You have boundaries. Uh, uh, the the um, another sorry. Uh, in contrast to needs is what we call want. Want is something beyond even your capacity to achieve. You know you want a Mercedes. Uh, you want what Lamborghini. Uh, but uh, you uh, only need a proton saga, kan? Proton. So needs is, uh, is is a concept. It is a personal factor. So we talk about that one later. Norm is something that is imposed on you. Okay. A needs is also uh, posing on you, but norms is another level of imposition. Uh, normally in the form of um, cultural uh, norms and uh, religious norms. The Muslim, you have to pray five times a day, uh, impose on you, you have no choice. Or um, everybody, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, your celebration, you have to come home, no matter where you are, you have to come home because that is a norm imposed on you. Uh, personality, as I said, your personal being, um, values are, you know, uh, your uh, individual standards individual standards, okay? You buy only uh, black colored uh, clothes because you value black as more important than white, more important than red. So that is values, that is what we call uh, individual standard and goals. Uh, goals are normally uh, quite straightforward. Uh, you drink because you are thirsty. You drink water because you are thirsty. If you are thirsty, you don't find coffee. You know, uh, of course, uh, you find um, uh, cold drink. Why you drink cold drink? Because I want to quench my thirst. That is goal. Cool. You know, uh, it it is less meaningful, but it is important for you to achieve. Okay, why do you go to toilet? Uh, my goal is just to relieve uh, all this uh, this waste. You know, from my body. Um, you know, if uh, it is not uh, that meaningful, it is uh, important. Those are goals. Okay, so at least I have already shared with you uh, the uh, personal 
uh, influencing factors in built environment, your needs, your norms, your personality, your goals, and your values. Uh, not only you, but also uh, other people. Okay, personal factors are not static. They are changing and varied. Okay, so uh, the personal factors is changing and varied. Uh, you tend to change your personal, your needs, your norms, your personality, your values. Uh, when you are a student, uh, when many of, of you are working students. When you were not a working student, full-time student in uh, other universities, in polytechnic, for example, your needs were different uh, from what you need now. You know, uh, at that time, your needs was only uh, two minutes Maggie me, that was your need. Uh, now you said uh, it is no longer in the list of my, my food. You know, now my needs is uh, nasi ayam, at least or nasi goreng mama, you know, at least you have increased. So it changed. And also not only that, it is varied. You uh, you have, you need or uh, differently from your friend. I, I don't need uh, dinner. I just need uh, early dinner. But some of you need supper. You know, at 10 o'clock, you must have me goreng mama before you go to sleep. So those are quick examples on needs. So these personal factors tend to be um, uh, dynamic, not static, and they are changing and varied. So as I gave you an example, um, uh, those are simple examples. For your information, this is for you to, to, to note down uh, if you have a piece of uh, paper and a pen. Um, a person will change his life cycle course. You know, you change your life cycle at least eight times during your lifetime. Uh, that, that is what uh, uh, research has found. Uh, you change your life cycle um, from uh, being uh, a kid to a schoolboy, and then uh, you are no longer uh, playing uh, the toys that you played when you were a kid. You know, uh, that is the first change. Later, uh, you uh, graduated, then you change. You know, you even change the place of living. You may not be living with your families anymore. And then you got married. You know, uh, you have life partner. And then you change your uh, life cycle course. Again, you may not be living with your friends. You love your family. You, you, you used to live with your friend. Now you cannot live with your friend anymore. You have your own family. You change your house. And you want to have your own house. And then, uh, you know, uh, you, you have children and you change, you know, uh, you were living in an apartment, a studio apartment, when uh, only two of you uh, sharing your life. But now you have three children. So a studio unit is no longer appropriate. So you, you, uh, you, uh, you, want, you want to buy a new house, accommodating uh, more members of your family. And then you get all oh, your children's, you know, all this uh uh life uh, cycle costs okay which are changing so uh, when you design built environment you tend to see this changing uh, or these changes of life cycle costs into consideration uh, when you design any building for you know whatever um, requirement based on the life cycle cost okay I hope we can capture a very brief uh, explanation on the uh, personal factors. Um, to go into more focus on what we mentioned, the needs, um, uh, this has been, uh, I have been using this in many of my lectures. And in one, in one uh, uh, forum, I also highlighted this. You know, uh, the keyword to behavioral data is user needs. And you also uh, use the term user requirement or user preferences or user expectation. When you, um, when you, I think you know all these um, words, uh, but I hope you and you know this one more critically when you are relating this to what we call uh, scientific data. User need is no longer uh, uh, user need as a language, but it is user need as a concept. Okay, um, as I said, user needs is, is more realistic. Okay. Um, 
User needs in environment are motivated by the following categories. These are the, the four or five categories of user needs. One is elemental need. Uh, this is important for you to, uh, to be able to identify. Elemental need is, um, is very much physiological. You know, a physiological is a bodily need, you know, needs of your body. Okay, uh, basic needs associated with shelter, health, security, breathing, uh, hearing, vision, you know, all these are your basic needs. Toilets in architecture uh, is a basic need. Um, uh, bedroom is a basic need. You cannot have a, a, a house without bedroom if you are in a family, because there is another a basic need, you know, relationship uh, between you and wife, man and woman, you know, is a, is a basic need, that is a basic need you know, um, may it be for reproduction or may it be for recreational, you know, uh, you and your wife uh, need to fulfill these basic needs and the architecture need to fulfill these basic needs. So you look at uh, the spaces as to, uh, uh, to fulfill this elemental need, okay? Secondly is functional needs. There are two categories of uh, functional needs. One is uh, what we call expressional needs or latent function. Uh, this is the need for decorative elements, you know, ornamentation, furniture. So you don't blame your wife for, um, for men, don't blame your wife if they want to have decorative curtain, if they want to have beautiful sofa, if they want to have nice, um, you know, uh, picture frames in your houses, because that is a need. Those are needs, you know, uh, what we call expressional need. Of course, uh, um, you don't do it uh, overly, you know, uh, for economic reason. Uh, that is very much individual, okay? But these needs are functional, uh, are considered as functional need, which is expressional need. Another need is functional or instrumental function. Uh, I use the term man and machine relationship. It's actually this need is, is considered vital because uh, a kitchen must perform as a kitchen. You cannot imagine in the kitchen you don't have, um, you know, you don't have storage. You don't have, uh, you know, the sink for you to wash your food uh, in your preparation. You know, uh, you must have those. Those are considered as instrumental function, you know, in which uh, you need to fulfill all this. You know, uh, a living room must perform as a living room. So what is the basic um, uh, instruments uh, for a living room? You know, um, maybe nowadays we use uh, sofa, sitting you know as your instrumental function to fulfill your instrumental function when your guests come in and you ask them you let them to sit so instrumentally that is a function of the sofa okay so this is actually uh, a need you know uh, that need to be fulfilled and the third one is psychological needs uh, this is a higher level of needs uh, you are talking about symbolic and cognitive needs. You know, uh, you want your house to represent you. You know, you want your house uh, to, you know, to people know that this belong to you. Your house actually reflecting your success. You know, your house is in Putrajaya, a bungalow lot. The price is 5.3 million. You know, um, you know, it is the same way. Uh, you use, uh, you know, uh, five million uh, bungalows and even uh, a terrace house. Actually, the function remains the same. Uh, you need the bedroom, the bedroom for you to retire, to sleep. And the same way you do um, either uh, within the five million dollars bungalow or in uh, 100,000 uh, terrace house. But, you know, uh, the five million dollars bungalow could be your psychological needs to reflect who you are, the higher level of needs. Okay, uh, if you are doing business, people would be more um, confident with you if you have, uh, if you have a, pre rep a representation that you are rich, you are financially stable. So that could be the purpose of your 
uh, the building. You know, we talk about office building, uh, also the same. Uh, psychological need, sometimes it is part of the, uh, of your representation, okay? As someone, you know, that may be useful uh, for psychosocial, we call it, uh, your relationship with others and also your relationship with your customers. And need for social context. You know, um, need for social contact. I don't put any comment in there because it is very uh, common, very um, uh, obvious to everyone. You need friends, uh, you need neighbors, you know, uh, you need partners. Uh, these are um, also uh, representing the needs uh, for the built environment. Okay, you want your house uh, to be a means for you to socialize. You want your uh, your office um, to relate you to your customers. So this is actually uh, the needs for social context. Okay, all these needs are greatly influenced by norms. Remember, I talk about norms, values, interests, personality, goals, and preferences. So all these needs are represented uh, by the personal factors which we discussed in uh, uh, the earlier um slides okay and these are all for, these are all what we call culture i hope you understand culture is not only uh the the way people dress but culture is is a system which is already exists uh in the society uh shared by the society and transform you know uh to the later generation and uh, it can be also uh, revealed, uh, for example, the religious needs. So this is actually culture. You know, you share um, the system that you shared and transmitted uh, through generation. This is culture. It is beyond uh, what you always remember, cara berpakaian, you know, cara uh, kita uh, berkeluarga. So that is part of the culture. That is actually uh, the normal understanding of culture, but culture in the context of uh, research is referring to the, sh the shared values, the shared element in the community, and also uh, the, the, the culture is being used uh, to guide uh, the community, okay? So all these personal factors are actually uh, expression of culture. Okay, culture. I think I have already mentioned a little bit. Uh, culture is the configuration of learned behavior and results of behavior whose components are shared and transmitted by members of a particular society. If you heard my explanation, I can. I think you can uh, understand. Sorry, if you listen carefully to my explanation earlier, I think you can understand what is the definition of culture now. And this is another definition of culture which is uh, transmitted and created content and patterns of values, ideas, and other symbolic meaningful system as factors in the shaping of human behavior and the artifacts produced through behavior. I think uh, if you are taking uh, this um, uh, architecture and behavior subject, um, I'm not sure if that subject is offered uh, at your level. I think that subject uh, I used to teach this subject, but to the undergraduate students. I'm not sure if this is also offered at uh, postgraduate, but never mind. At least this is um, uh, the platform in which uh, you can understand a little bit about um, uh, these personal factors, psychological uh, factors. Okay, characteristic of culture. We talk about culture. These are what culture is used, a guide to action standard and norms for judging behavior. Culture is a set of learned responses. Quite straightforward. Learned responses are uh, uh, value-laden. And uh, culture facilitates problem solving. You know, you have problems in the community, uh, you are referring to what the culture um, asks you to do. And what are the guides, whether it is written or not written, uh, within that cultural context, okay? So it facilitates problem solving. All right, so, sorry. Um, 
Okay, these are uh, some of the uh, functions or characteristic of culture. Okay, so from now on, I hope you understand when we say culture, it is not only about um, the dressing of the people, not only about um, the, uh, the food that we take. Another uh, quick or brief uh, definition of culture is uh, what makes uh, two different groups uh, are different. Okay, um, uh, obviously, um, ethnic is considered as different groupings. Okay, the Malay, the Chinese, they have different cultural characteristics. But within the Malays, there are also different groups of Malays. You, you have Kalantanis, you have Kedahan, uh, you have Selangorian, like myself. I'm not Johorian for your information. Um, and we tend to be different. You know, uh, some of my kids, they don't take voodoo, you know, uh, though in Kelantan, voodoo is a mask. All right. And um, also, uh, sometimes uh, we have some significant differences. And not only among Malays, among, you know, people in a kampung, you know, one kampung, you have a different group of people. So, so you must remember cultural characteristics tend to be uh, different uh, within uh, among different groups. So this is what culture. So when you mention the word culture, I hope now you understand culture is uh, defined as you know what we have discussed here. Now when we talk about needs, just to share with you, okay, needs. There are levels of needs, okay. Um, uh, the two are very pressing needs. The first two are very pressing. In, in fact, the, the one, two, three are very pressing needs. Okay, this is the need um, concept uh, or theories of need by Abraham Maslow, which have been used. One of my students um, used this uh, um, Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, in, um, in his uh, studies on housing. Okay, so if you look at this needs, uh, um, it is very common that uh, in all of us, uh, we tend to have the five level of needs. The two and some of, some of us, the, the first three from the bottom, physiological needs, security needs, and social needs are very much pressing needs. But the first and the second are the very uh, pressing needs you cannot do without. Physiological need, you need water, food, sleep, sex, and, uh, and also, you know, other things which are considered as physiological need. Physiological need is, cons you know, another, another word for physiological is a bodily need, you know. The needs of your body. You cannot do without water. You cannot do without food, you know. You cannot do without sleep. So this is a very basic need, very pressing need. So when we uh, remember, when we have uh, any countries in trouble, these are the needs that we need to cater for, you know, uh, for humanitarian, humanitarian uh, assistance are normally uh, based on this uh, physiological need. Secondly, um, also very pressing is security need. This is uh, freedom from fear, needs for order and rules to guide action, so you need security, you need, you need law to be enforced. You need rulers, though you hate rulers, uh, this is not political speech. You hate ru rulers, rulers are not good, but you still need rulers because that is the needs of human being in terms of security. Okay, so um, this, uh, these two level of needs uh, have been uh, translated into architecture. I don't have the time to share with you. Uh, I'm not sure if I have it in my slide. There are uh, these two implicate uh, certain uh, spaces or certain mechanism architecturally uh, to fulfill. Okay, that the level of need, social need, you need uh, love, affection, belongingness, you need friends, you need um, a relationship with your family members, uh, you need your neighbors. Sometimes your neighbors is uh, your close friend, your relative. Sometimes your neighbors, who uh, your neighbors, who, whoever they are, 
you know, um, and also another level, higher level is esteem. You know, uh, you want to be seen as a person, you want to be seen as something su successful and self-actualization. So uh, the higher you go, uh, the more, uh, the higher level of needs actually uh, affected you, affecting you. So if you look at cognitive and aesthetic satisfaction, this is the needs of very rich people. You know, um, uh, actually, uh, there, there is another two level of needs uh, by Maslow hierarchy of needs, but that is actually uh, developed uh, in 1970s after this need. So we just discuss until this. Um, you see, uh, the needs of um, uh, Bill Gates is no longer your needs. You know, he, he never think of how can he uh survive until the end of the month you know because that is actually has been fulfilled so the first second uh the first and second needs uh, uh just to be fulfilled after that you are going into the higher level of needs so um uh you you can see uh, if you want to read further about needs so you will see uh in housing uh, there are also different level of needs Okay, so if you if we're talking about best need, you just need to um, uh, two bedroom a house, even uh, apartment house, a walk up apartment is also su sufficient. But the higher you go, the richer you get, your needs tend to be different. Your needs tend to be going higher. So um, the two level of need is very pressing need, the first and second, and the rest uh, are very much um, depending upon uh, your level of achievement, okay, um, uh, financially and also socially. And under the level, under the factors, uh, personal factors, uh, sorry, environmental, sorry, personal factors are competence. Okay, users' competence level also determine their ability to perform and intended activities. This is this is um, something uh, quite new, I think, uh, since a number of years ago. Uh, but um, I think in the, the the new millennium, we started to consider uh, human competence in design. Uh, we are talking about disabilities. Now we look at disability as uh, a component of design, which we have to consider, you know, uh, because they are part of a society. They have uh, limited abilities or unique abilities. So therefore, uh, in the design, um, that is uh, another personal factor that you have to take into consideration. The government and uh, basically uh, the international communities, all communities in the world are now giving uh, you know a, a special treatment to people with different competence the disabled so you have uh, you 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 come across the word universal design you know or design for disabled and whatnot so these are actually addressing the comp different competence all right i think we we have been talking about um, uh, personal factors the thing that you need to consider uh, in order to uh, to obtain information uh, that are needed for your design. So collecting behavioral data, I think this is, uh, we are going into a more uh, relevant uh, information about the design, especially the research part of the design. Um, uh, sorry, uh, it is quite small. These are some of the uh, methods of behavioral data uh, elicitation. Uh, I have written a book on um, using, sorry, um, using behavior, understanding behavior in architectural design. Uh, the, uh, in one of the book uh, written in 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2017, and if you can have that book, uh, I think the book is still on sale uh, at UTM bookstore. Um, uh, this is a book chapter. The book is um, edited by um, one of our ex-lecturer, um, Tarif Hayat. Um, you can find the books. I can't remember the title of the books. Okay, and uh, one of the content of the book is my chapter uh, on this. And this is available from that books. 
Okay, these are methods of behavioral data elicitation. You know, I'm not going to go into detail, otherwise our lecture, my lecture will be very lengthy. Uh, the method, uh, I just uh, share with you important uh, content of this table. One is interview. I think one method is interview. So the technique use uh, verbal data directly asking the users uh, open-ended interview, you know, uh, you can read through uh, semi-structured interview. Uh, you know, you have to read all this in order to understand. It is easy for you to understand. Application, uh, you can see to elicit detail and deeper understanding of the design expectation, to elicit expectation which are not uh, predictable by the designers and applicable for new proposed project as well as to investigate existing environmental setting. Okay, so these are the things that you need to read. I think um, I can give you the slide so that, uh, or you can find the book so that you can read. When you are dealing with the behavioral uh, data collection, um, uh, these are the techniques. One is interview. Second is questionnaire. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. Uh, I think if um, I was informed by uh, Dr. Izik, you will be also collecting data through questionnaire. Am I right? Can someone uh, answer my question? Are you going to do questionnaire? Yeah. Is it? No, actually, yeah. they, are, they are going to collect data through questionnaire and they, they can choose the, whether they want to do interview and mm -hmm. uh, or, or by questionnaire. Okay. Okay, either way, um, either way or both ways, uh, you have to understand uh, uh, what are the basic requirement. Interview, you don't have minimum number of respondents, um, but um, the more respondents you have is the better. Yeah, I used to take only 17 uh, interview. My student 20 and my latest PhD student uh, interviewed uh, 30 respondent interview, but questionnaire you need minimum 30, but you don't settle down with 30. Uh, previous years, I think the last uh, batch of students, uh, maybe some of them are still here, they took 100 because 100 considered as uh, a good minimum. Although 30 is acceptable, but uh, 100 is minimum. So you use questionnaire. Questionnaire is very much you already uh, set the question, you just uh, ask the question. I think this one uh, to be uh, discussed with your uh, with your lecturer's supervisor. So questionnaire, um, you know, you have to understand what are the variables that you need to um, uh, to address. Okay, uh, what do you want to know? So this must be planned earlier before you ask uh, the respondents. Okay, uh, analysis can be done, uh, free, uh, can be, can be uh, in terms of frequency or more sophisticated uh, statistical tools. I think uh, if, you, uh, if you know, if you start to read SPSS, you know, social, statistical, statistical package for social science, so you will see a number of uh, statistical uh, method yeah, that you can use, you know, to analyze. Okay, um, um, okay, uh, tend to be broader. I don't know, I cut something here. Uh, this method can be used for uh, newly proposed design and also um, uh, you can also use to measure uh, design that has been uh, implemented, has been completed and has been used, what, what we call POE post-occupancy evaluation. Okay, questionnaire is one method, interview is another method. Two sound, the two sound similar, but they are not similar, they are different. So observation, this is what we call non-verbal behavior. So using images, using behavioral mapping. Um, if you have the time, you can read the slides here so that you understand. Uh, this is another option which you can use in order to understand how people behave you know, uh, using video uh, images, 
using uh, photography or uh, using behavioral mapping. Okay, uh, another method for you to understand, uh, to collect data on uh, human behavior. Mapping also uh, space syntax. Uh, who have been with Dr. Sharifa Salwa? I think you know what is space syntax. Uh, cognitive mapping. Um, uh, I think um, some of you might have done this uh, this technique of cognitive mapping. You know, uh, you ask people to go around the places and ask them to draw back what uh, they have seen. Uh, that is what we call cognitive mapping. Or you ask somebody uh, to draw what they know about Kuala Lumpur, for example, and ask them to draw what buildings they have seen. So all these are part of these cognitive mapping techniques. So another techniques is uh, to get the data for uh, be, uh, the, the behavior is the book of standard or secondary data, uh, which is also common and also journal articles, books, um, sorry, uh, journal articles, books and book chapter, conference article. If we notice here, book of standard has been used widely, okay, by many of us. You know, because uh, you have uh, a, a direct suggestion on what are the scales supposed to be for that building, what are the dimensions supposed to be for that supposed to be for that building. Okay, so please uh, uh, refer to all this. I'm not sure how many of you uh, have seen general articles uh, for uh, students who are already at thesis level. I think you have. Uh, the uh, you have the knowledge already on journal articles. You might have assessed the um, uh, the journals, and you might have um, um, downloaded uh, some of the articles or the books for that matter. Okay, uh, books and book chapters and conference articles. Okay, and also case study. Okay, uh, some sometimes you know. Uh, sorry, case study has been a very common. Uh, techniques of getting information yeah, uh, for uh, for you to refer to with respect to your design. Okay, um, I think this is another uh, another uh, another uh, data through cognition, uh, cognitive images of building in cities, uh, and uh, it is actually continuation from uh, the earlier tables. Uh, which uh, are suggesting a method uh, to uh, elicit information on uh, the behavior, uh, human behavior, uh, which can be useful for uh, your design. Okay. Um, I think I missed one information that is uh, environmental attributes. See if uh, I have them uh, in this uh slides otherwise i have to uh, mention to you later okay uh remind me um otherwise uh, you have to come back to me if you want to know what is meant by environmental attributes okay preparing building program i mentioned to you uh building program um and also uh besides building program there is behavioral program okay uh uh, this is the the the, the method of uh, preparing this uh, building program. Uh, one of the suggestions, okay, uh, designing behavioral program uh, that is a process of environment adaptation, or changing physical setting in response to changes in activities or aesthetic taste, or changes in demand for person environment congruence. You know, if you read this, you will understand. Building program can be prepared based on the following level of needs. Um, what I mean here is the one that I explained to you, you know, uh, when you talk about behavioral program, you are talking about uh, the relationship between uh, the personal factors of an individual to the, uh, the spaces that you need to design for this particular person. I give you a simple example, a bedroom uh, is seen differently by different person. So in order for you to provide for that particular person, so um, you have to understand their behavior, you know, how they use and what their expectation, their norms, their values in order for you to establish uh, their behavior in the bedroom. 
Okay, that is what we call behavioral program. Okay, building program, as I said earlier, uh, it is uh, bas basically uh, the need for a uh, name of the room, a function of the room, and sizes of the room. Okay, these are, okay, let me go back. Okay, um, right, I think uh, the following slides um, is, uh, I have uh, stressed on this, uh, the following slides. Uh, uh, this is about uh, the way we manage uh, the building program. Uh, you, if, if, you, if you come across, I don't know how, you, how many of you know uh, the meaning of novelty. You know what is novelty? Novelty is uniqueness or difference, or keistimewaan, you know, uh, yang orang lain tak ada, dia ada. Okay, uh, Dr. Izzy, can you give me uh, uh, three minutes? I need to have a break uh, for three minutes. Sorry. Okay, uh, sure, Dr. Mahmoud. Yeah, sure. uh, panggilan alam semula jadi. <laughs> give me, uh, give me uh, five minutes. Nature is calling. Okay, Dr. Mahmoud. <laughs> Nature is calling, all men. <laughs> Okay, students, three minutes uh, rest, yeah? Stay tuned. Uh, yes, why is I'm recording. Uh, I'm recording this uh, this session. Uh, later after after the lecture, I will share the link, lah. I will share the link uh, of the recording. Thank you, doctor. And uh, I think after after this session, I'm going to open back the QR code for attendance. So for those who have not uh, scanned the QR code for attendance, you can scan after this, lah. Right. Okay, guys, please take note of this lecture, yeah, because uh, this one directly, uh, this lecture is actually directly involved your task number one, especially task 1B. So it is very important for you guys to take note of this lecture, okay, for you guys to complete task number one. Okay, please make sure that uh, during uh, crit number one, uh, which is next two weeks, uh, you guys have to present uh, the data that you have collected. Uh, basically, you have to present your task number one, lah, task one A, one B, and one C as well. So uh, it's a group, uh, it's a group work. So you guys have to present as a group, lah, basically. And uh, crit number one is actually a seminar, so. Okay, guys. Okay. Uh, okay, that's one. Yeah, can we start again? Okay, sure. All right. Um, okay, uh, as I said, the following slide, I think you, uh, you better uh, pay attention, all students. Uh, when you are designing building program, and also uh, the, uh, the level of what we call uh, the term that I use, novelty or uniqueness, um, in the design, you don't have to um, you don't have to make 
uh, every single thing in your building as unique. I think um, uh, otherwise uh, your task will be very difficult. So there are a suggestion uh, by uh, you know certain school of thought that when you design uh, a behavioral program, uh, there are uh, I think two, three level of needs that um, uh, you you can address. Sorry. Okay, uh, read this one carefully. Um, you can uh, read together with me so that you can understand. Uh, one is custom need. When you when you do your design, your building program, you know uh, the the basic levels of need that uh, you can uh, address is custom needs. What is a custom need? Custom need is used is routine needs that can be considered as needs which have been addressed repeatedly in the previous design. Many elemental needs and functional needs uh, that is instrumental needs are commonly uh, but not necessarily repetitive. Uh, if these needs are not to be manipulated into unique or novel design, repeating the previous behavioral pat pattern can be a viable option. Give you an example. Um, if you think uh, toilets is not going to be a novel design, it's not go going to be a unique design. So you can just directly borrow, you know, uh, the design of uh, toilets based on the um, the book of standards. You know, based on the number of occupants, based on the size of the building, uh, these are the requirements for a toilet. So it can be a very simple and straightforward uh, decision, decision. Okay. Uh, oh, this is also what we call routine design. I think uh, we may be talking about that one later. One is custom need, in which the needs are uh, very common and has been used repetitively, repeatedly, and you can just uh, take this need, uh, you know, uh, directly without further elaboration or further, um, you know, research. Okay. Secondly, unique need. All needs are potentially unique and instrumental function needs can be unique if they have uncommon elements to be addressed. Okay, um, for example, a toilet can be a custom need, but can also be unique if it is meant for users with certain competence or the user require certain uh, unique design features. Expressional function, psychological and social contact needs belong to the higher level of need. They often require unique element to reach the design goals. Needs belonging to this category should be more elaborated in the behavioral program. So unique needs, uh, you may uh, use this, you may want to express this in any of the design. Okay, um, uh, the bedroom, the living room, uh, office building uh, to represent uh, themselves, their organization. That could be the potential uniqueness of the design. So this is what we call unique needs. Some uh, of the uh, routine needs or um, the um, custom needs can be can become unique needs if you want to be uh, so. So it depends on you or also requirement or needs of the uh, of your client. Okay. So this is unique need. Another level of needs is needs requiring user participation. Okay, this is actually an interesting suggestion made by one of my students in his PhD thesis. Uh, um, that is uh, preferred house attributes which fall under higher level of need, remember? If you can still remember uh, the needs of uh, the, the, the five level, the hierarchy of needs, Maslow hierarchy of needs in my earlier slides, you can see um, 
the, the higher level of me, that is self-esteem and self-actualization in the Maslow hierarchy of needs require users active participation in the making of the environment. Meaning that the needs at that level, self-esteem and self-actualization uh, for a house, for example, because this is talking about a house, cannot be done uh, without the participation of the users. So meaning that for that particular uh, need, you need the part participant. So, sorry, the, the users to participate, to get involved in the design process, okay? Designers are often unable to satisfy the users for these needs due to high abstraction, complex and multi-dimensional nature of the preferred attributes, okay? So, because when you talk about what people want, you know, um, the abstraction of what they want, tend to be difficult to comprehend. So therefore, you need them to be involved in the, in the design process. That is the higher level of niche. Several unique design problems in commercial and public building uh, place or places require direct participation of the clients in the design process. Lower needs like physiological and safety. Remember, we talk about physiological need and safety needs are more de definitive. Therefore, designers are able to identify the design problem to be addressed. So you don't have to worry. Um, designers know that all building need roof and all building need, to uh, need toilets and all buildings uh, need, um, you know, some of the basic spaces. So all this, you don't need to uh, get the users to involve in the design process. You can just ask uh, sorry, you can just use book of standard. Okay. So these are the three level of need: custom needs, um, unique needs, and needs requiring user participation. Ah. Let's see what? Okay. Categories of design solution. Okay, uh, this this is taken from uh, one of my reference, one of my references. Uh, design solution can be uh, in three levels. Okay, I think you have to take this one uh, um, seriously. Yeah. Be attentive to this, please, all of you. Um, I keep actually asking uh, when I treat students, these are uh, my my favorite questions or my favorite comments, okay? As I indicated earlier, when we talk about uh, needs, some of the needs um, representing uh, the uh, the design solution, okay? And uh, so at least there are three different design solutions that you can go for. Okay, uh, so not every design solution, uh, it takes your time. Uh, you need to take time and to go into a deeper studies. Some of them are very basic and very routine. This is what we call routine design. Okay, uh, the solution are adapted from the previous design solution, similar to when we discussed on needs. Design, this routine design solution are the solution that are adapted from the previous design solution. So uh, the design is not meant for novelty. You don't you don't want to make it uh, very unique. No need to be unique. It is normal one. Elemental needs is to mention function or some spaces for social context uh, may only require solution within this category. As I said, toilet, bedroom, sports hall, etc. Many of them are requiring only simple solutions straightforward from book of standard. However, user needs should be able to be fulfilled by the adopted solution. A good source, source of this uh, class of creativity is building standards, which suggest design guides for certain building types. Some designers learn and adopted design solution from previous design through case of precedent studies. Okay, I think uh, for you who have been working in offices, I think you you are aware that some of the design um, are required to be to be prepared in three hours. Okay, your boss got to uh, uh, tell you 
please do this design. Boleh design tak hall ini? Uh, there are some other spaces, uh, some shop here. Can you do it uh, this afternoon? Um, you are given in the morning and they ask uh, for a drawing in the afternoon. What did you do? There are basically there are two ways you do. One is uh, based on the previous design that you have experienced or that you have done or your office have done it. Yeah, you just, um, you know, copy and paste. The other one is based on a book of standards, you know, a sports hall, then you don't know. We don't, we never design sports hall. Go and see, uh, look at uh, the uh, sports hall and try to suit uh, the design with the site given to you. So you do it in, you know, uh, one day, two days, or three days. So um, this is what we call routine design. Uh, but in School of Architecture, academically, we don't want this to be uh, the only uh, uh, selection, you know, um, because, um, you know, in learning process, uh, you need to go into a more complex one. Okay. Uh, at least the second level is innovative design. Innovative design uh, is the design in which the solution is still conforming to previous examples still similar uh, to the normal practices, but they have additional features, at least one features that make them novel, that make them make them novel. Okay, I think uh, an easy example is uh, designing a sports hall, for example. You know, uh, the normal design, um, the, uh, the, the, the hall are like this, but um, in your design, uh, the um, the client wants you to make make a difference. For example, take into consideration uh, the location of the hall. For example, in the jungle, on on top of a hill. Then there are another things that you need to add another features. You know, at least one features to make it to make the design innovative, different from uh, other sports halls. Okay, and this is what we call innovative design. So the design is not uh, straightforward taken from the book of standard, but it is uh, uh, it went through uh, the uh, some elaboration into the design, so that the design becoming more unique. That is innovative design. Uh, the highest level is what we call creative design. Uh, the solution are highly different from the previous example. You know, uh, meaning that uh, you are introducing something new. The ideas may have elements that are in different dimension, in which the existing sources of reference may be less relevant. Needs of all categories are potentially felt within these categories. Creative design depends on intelligence of the designer. This is very much about you. So you can turn uh, innovative design into a more creative design. I think one example which I noticed, um, uh, one student uh, previously designed, uh, you know, uh, the, the building uh, by using um, the, the byproducts of uh, the septic tank, I forgot the name of it. So uh, they, they, they get uh, energy and they, they get, uh, I think fertilizer, I can't remember uh, that project, uh, which is developed through the septic tank of the building. You know, sounds disgusting, but that is actually an interesting design, uh, which is actually um, recycling uh, something uh, that can be used uh, in the design. I think if not mistaken, uh, the building is also related to urban farming, you know, it's, it's farming and the byproducts, uh, the farming is actually using uh, uh, the, the byproducts, you know, from uh, the system that they have in the building, especially the uh, sanitary system. Uh, doesn't sound uh, interesting, isn't it? But the idea is actually brilliant. You know, um, that is uh, what we call a creative design, which is beyond, uh, you know, realization. So that is very much your creative design. So at university, um, uh, at university level, 
um, you don't settle at routine design only. At least you go into innovative design. Or preferably, if it is possible, if you are creative enough, then you can go beyond uh, imagination that is creative design. So these are the three level of design solution. You know, from uh, the data you collected and you turn it into design program, uh, sorry, building program, and your design levels are these three different level of design. I think those are the things uh, uh, that I can share with you uh, today. Um, just to recap, um, we have been talking about, I have been talking about, um, you know, uh, linking uh, research to design. You know, we have to change um, uh, the way uh, we did design conventionally or traditionally. Uh, the source of data, not only directly from the users, but a source of data are coming from, um, you know, the research that you do. So data elicitation uh, is coming from the, the, the and then um, you develop building programs systematically. And also more importantly, when you uh, design your building, there are three levels of uh, design solution. One is routine design. Secondly is innovative design. And thirdly is um, creative design. Um, so I have given you examples on design for social culture, you know, related to uh, studies on behavior or psychology. There are other design areas that have been used in, you know, in helping the design of a building, uh, like um, building sciences. You know, uh, some of you might have done that. Uh, environmental design, for example, building that is um, uh, using daylighting, uh, passive design. So this is another level of design and also uh, other level of design in, in the context of uh, uh, urban studies, for example. So there are many other examples which you will experience later. For, for you who have gone through, you might have seen uh, the different design approaches based on different uh, areas of research. So I think uh, that's all I have um, to uh, uh, to convey to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, we still have the time. Okay, um, I hand over the session to you, Dr. Izik. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for the very useful lecture to the students. Okay, guys, uh, do you have any question to ask Dr. Mahmoud? You can just uh, type in the question on the chat box or you can just open your mic and uh, say your question to us. Anyone? All right, if you guys have no questions, uh, later on I will share this uh, the, the lecture recording to you guys. And um, please uh, make sure that you guys uh, check the WhatsApp group from time to time i will update the google drive link for our recorded uh, recorded session all right um no question eh, guys <laughs> because this lecture is very important for you guys especially when you are doing uh, your task number one okay for social culture uh pretices. okay this lecture is very important it's very relatable to your task number one so uh I hope you guys understood what uh, what Dr. Mahmoud already uh, lectured about. So uh, I'll be seeing you guys in the next uh, two weeks uh, for face-to-face -face session, grid number one, our seminar. So please um, complete your task number one. Okay, task number one, one A, one B, and also one C. All right. So uh, if there is nothing else, uh, I think I should share back the QR code uh, for the attendance, uh, both theses and pretheses as well. Okay, so I will leave this session open for another 10 minutes. Okay, guys, so thank you for coming. Uh, the students, thank you for coming. Uh, oh, yeah, we have another question, Dr. Yeah. Uh, how can we determine the capacity of our building programs? Dr. <laughs> one there question was... suddenly yeah. come out. Uh, how can we determine the capacity of our building program? Capacity actually is very straightforward, is determined by your client. 
uh, there are two ways of uh, you see there are two ways of designing one is based on uh, you know requirement of the uh, of the client if the client say i want uh, this uh, housing scheme for uh, uh, 1000 families or 1000 units you know 10 uh, sorry uh, 200 for uh, three bedroom and so on and so forth those are uh, a stated uh, capacity another capacity is based on um, the design this is actually uh, normally happen in uh, uh, design competition you know, uh, particularly uh, suitability of, uh, you know, sizes, community sizes, that will be uh, determined by the designer. It depends on the design. Uh, I can't give you any uh, immediate clues, but it depends on, you know, uh, the nature of the program. Uh, remember, uh, there are, if you uh, look at um, uh, the design of Moshe Sabde, Moshe Sabde, if you can, uh, Moshe Sabde, Sabde, I think, M-O-S-E, uh, space S-A-F-D-E, you will see uh, this unique uh, uh, building. You know, the design is not the same as uh, the design of uh, the conventional one. Uh, I don't know any one of you uh, managed to surf the internet on the uh, most, uh, the design of Mosi Sabdi. And that design obviously uh, may not able to cater the standard uh, number of capacity. It has to go through, uh, you know, his design. I haven't read, I can't give you any uh, figures on the, uh, the capacity of the design. So uh, if I can just uh, look at Mosi Sabdi, if I can just share. Anyone, you, anyone of you have seen the design of Mosi Sabdi? You want me to show you to find in the internet? Uh, uh, I need a few seconds to get it. Let me check. Okay, let me check. Okay, uh, if I can share with you, hang on, let me see. Uh, all right. If I can share with you. Can you see this? Yes, at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the the housing? Um, you see this. Uh, I don't know how can I enlarge. Ah, this one looks better, isn't it? Uh, this house is uh, very much interlocking uh, units. If you can see here, uh, I cannot imagine, um, you know, uh, the uh, the number of uh, units similar uh, to the one, uh, you know, in the conventional system. But this is actually uh, a unique design. Uh, if you can see here, uh, the the building itself, the buildings themselves are interlocking, and there are a number of advantages uh, achieved through uh, the interlocking of the, the block. And you can see uniqueness. So there are so many uh, advantages and disadvantages. But this is the kind of building in which, um, you know, it is, uh, this is creative solution. I remember I mentioned about creative solution and in which I think uh, uh, the capacity may not, may not be the same or they are in different ways. 
Okay, um, I think that, that is my answer to uh, the questions uh, asked by your friend. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mood. Okay. Uh, any other question, guys? Any other question before I end the session and upon back the QR code for attendance? Okay, uh, if you have no questions, uh, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ezik, for inviting yep. me. Uh, feel free if you want to uh, uh, to get anything from me, uh, any help. Um, I'm not an uh, official lecturer for this, but, uh, you know, as lecturers, I, I feel obliged if any one of you want to know anything from me. Thank you very much. I have to leave you, Dr. Izik. I have to leave you there. All the best to you, uh, guys. Assalamualaikum. Okay, Dr. Mood. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Dr. Mood. Okay, you're welcome.